shopping for and finding gifts for, for people in your lives. But you know, it's not just finding the gifts. After you get that gift, you have to actually do something with it, usually wrap it up. Now, I have to admit, I am an eco-friendly wrapper, which means, that's just a cool way to say, I only use gift bags, uh, because they can be used year after year after year after year, as long as you don't write on, don't write on the gift bag, that okay? gift bag giving pro. But I love those of you who, who spend the time wrapping presents and you find the perfect paper and the perfect ribbon and you even have the perfect way that you fold it. And, and I love all those of you who spend all that time doing it, especially for our, our Backpacks of Love kids this year and getting to deliver those gifts to the schools around us and the kids we are able to partner with throughout the year. Those presents look great. But I have to tell you something. Those kids, as well as any of the other kids uh, that you give presents to, if you ask them after the fact, what how is your present wrapped? They will not be able to answer that question. They will not be able to tell you how their present was wrapped or what type of paper they used or any of that because all that they're focused in is getting past the wrapping and actually getting to the present, to the gift. You gotta get the wrapping out of the way to get to what you're really giving to someone else. If you wanna remember the present, you actually have to take a picture of how it's wrapped because it disappears too quickly and it just gets thrown into the trash. 
You know, you think about it. Sometimes when it comes to remembering and celebrating the Christmas story, sometimes I think we get a little bit caught up in the wrapping. And the wrapping of the story, even in that first Bethlehem night with baby Jesus, gets a little bit confusing sometimes. Let's read again those words from Luke chapter 2 that the angels spoke to the shepherds as they watched over their fields by night. The angels said these words, and I invite you to say them, send them with me. They said, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in the manger. An unusual wrapping. A baby in cloths lying in a feed trough for animals. And yet that's exactly where this baby was placed. But listen to the words that is spoken to the shepherds. That unto you is born this day in the city of David. A Savior who is Christ the Lord. Unto you, shepherds, this is your baby, this is your child, this is your gift. Your name's on the tag. And it's incredible that this message is spoken to them, that this is personally their child. And, and I think about it in my own life, when my wife and I were getting ready to, to welcome a, a new baby into our family through the gift of birth. And I know that whether we've had children by birth or children through adoption, that when we have a new child, we, we send out announcements, we let people know, the new kid is here, we're so happy, celebrate with us. And I know what happens. People celebrate with us, but I don't say to them, good news, we had a baby and so did you. That would be strange. That'd be weird. There's sometimes I want to say that, and if you like babysitting, just give me your number afterwards, we can talk. But, but, but it's not your kid. It's my kid. But yet the angels say to the shepherds, unto you, you, is born a baby. It's Christ the Lord, and it's for you. And it's amazing that it's spoken to shepherds of all people. I know in our, in our stories of remembering shepherds or, or in our beautiful nativity set up here or the nativity nights at the beginning of the month, the bigger they have put on here in the first part of December, the shepherds in our story, they are good-looking shepherds. There's one of them right there. They are good-looking shepherds. They are clean-shaven. Their beards are trimmed. They showered. They got new, brand-new sandals, leather sandals. They're looking, they're looking pretty dapper for shepherds. But that's not realistic of what shepherds look like. Instead of looking like that, I think our shepherds who dress up out there and play that role in the month of nativity, that, that instead of no shade in November, we need to have no shower November. So that they can kind of smell like real shepherds would have smelled if they're out there staying with their flocks all night long, protecting them against any dangers. In fact, because of that profession, because you smelled so bad and because of what you did, you were, you were one of the, the outcast, kind of lower caste members of society. You weren't that important. You weren't learned. You weren't smart. You weren't, you weren't anybody. You're a shepherd. And yet God chooses to invite shepherds to know that the gift has been given and it's not just any gift. It's their gift. Your baby. It's incredible news. And we can see why the shepherd's response to the message of the angels continues like this. And read it with me. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph. get a message like this. And what kind of message is this? A child has been born, a savior for us? Yet it's an important message. We don't need to make sure, though, that, that we don't get wrapped up in, in what's lying in the manger. Then. Because sometimes when we see this story and we hear it, we think about the incredibleness of the arrival of this, of this human son and child. But we have to look past the manger a little bit more. And to remind ourselves that this is not just any ordinary human being. This is fully God as well, lying in a body in the manger. This is Emmanuel, God with us. We need to look past the manger to see that through this baby, the, the deaf will hear, the blind will see, 
The mute will speak, and incredibly, incredibly, the dead will come back to life. Sins will be forgiven. This is no ordinary child. This is Emmanuel. This is God with us and for us. An incredible, incredible news. Especially, especially for us now. Especially if this is one of those Christmases where it's a first Christmas for you. I was reminded of, of the powerfulness of first Christmases in our lives. Uh, a week and a half ago, my, my wife and I, we had been, been praying fervently. There's something that we pray fervently about every, every December. And the thing we pray fervently about is our visit to the man in the red suit at Bass Pro Shops and our kids. And the prayer that we pray is this. Dear Lord, please help them not to scream, cry, or kick Santa. <laughs> Praise be to God, he answers prayers. We made it to Bass Pro. They all got us. I don't care if they smile, okay? I don't even care if they look at the camera. Just get on the lap and get the picture so we can put it in the album. It was great. And then as we were, we're getting up and we're talking to Santa, he's talking to our kids, doing an excellent job with them. Santa notices that, that my wife is pregnant. And so he says to her, would you like to take a picture with Santa and baby's first Christmas? We thought, hey, that's pretty cool. And so Christine got up there, a little weird, honestly, too. But she got up there and she took that picture. Baby's first Christmas with Santa. There it is. There's that picture. <laughs> it's great. And first Christmas, this can be pretty great. Baby's first Christmas. The first Christmas as a couple. The first Christmas in the new house. The first Christmas with the new job. The first Christmas, uh, the celebrating something, a milestone in life you, that you'll remember and you'll never forget. There's great first Christmases that we want to remember. In fact, a lot of them we remember with ornaments we put on our tree. But then there's the other part of first Christmases. First Christmases we wish we never had to experience. First Christmas without that person at the table. It's always been there. And now that seat's empty. Those tough first Christmases, when the kids don't come home. Those first Christmases, when we're separated by distance, by brokenness. First Christmas without a job. First Christmas when we wonder how much longer we're going to be able to make it through. There's tough first Christmases. And on those first Christmases, it's hard to feel holly and jolly and like the <coughs> most wonderful time of the year when what you think about is who's missing and the hardness of it. First Christmas has been tough. And instead of being joyful and, and rejoicing, sometimes what's more near the surface is, is tears and crying. And we wonder, can I celebrate it this year? When what I seem to be saying or doing more often than anything is he's crying at Christmas. After all, I'm celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. This is God in a body in the flesh for, for me, but yet I just seem to be crying. The good news is, the good news is, is that when it comes to Christmas, tears are perfectly appropriate for Christmas. Because despite away in the manger, second verse saying these words, little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. You just need to tear that whole verse out of your song. Because I can guarantee you the very first words, noises coming out of the mouth of your Savior Jesus. Were not words, I'm here, celebrate. But it was a cry. A cry for his mother. A cry to be fed, a cry to be changed, a cry of experiencing the, the pain and, and agony of labor and birth. Jesus knows what it means to cry. Crying at the manger, absolutely. Later, 33 years later, Jesus showed up late to a funeral. It was one of his dearest friends. The sisters, they were the closest like family to him. And as Jesus arrives late, days after he's already been put into to his tomb, there at Lazarus' tomb, Jesus once again, what does he do? He, he weeps, he cries. 
And this is the Lord of life who is crying at the death of somebody that he knows in just a few moments. He's going to speak his name and Lazarus is going to come out. He knows a resurrection is coming. He doesn't, it, it's not out of his mind. He knows what's going to happen. But yet death, because of the brokenness it brings, brings tears to your Savior's eyes. And I don't know about you. But I find great comfort in a God who's willing to go all in for me. A God who knows my sorrows, who knows my pains, who knows my hurts. And he's going to do something for him that I should have to do for him. I should have to suffer for him. I should have to pay for him. But he says, no, this is my burden. I will gladly bear it. I'll take it upon myself on the cross because I am your Savior. I am for you. I am a God who sees, a God who hears, a God who loves, a God who comes, and a God who is with us. sees. From far beyond us, God hears. From his eternal distant home, God loves. He sees all people in all places. And it's easy for us to imagine that he does so from this perspective. High, beyond, distant, but then Christmas, it appears without earthly fanfare or celebration. The cry of this child screams that the same God who is above and beyond and distant has not only come close to us, but that he's indeed with us. So what if the name Emmanuel means what it means? Today, now, with us, the manger proclaims that the very presence of God is now present with us, in the mundane, in the uncertainty, in the mystery that lies beyond our understanding or explanation. God himself is with us in our joy and our happiness. He's with us in our sadness and our brokenness. He celebrates in the light with us. And he holds us in the dark with faithful and secure arms. What if the name Emmanuel means what it means? Christmas not only begs that we ask that question, but also provides the answer that our hearts have been longing for all along. Can this possibly be? Yes, it can. And it is God with us. Emmanuel. And he's closer than our wildest dreams can ever imagine. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we have become his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into your hearts. And now you can call God your dear father. Now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you're his own child, everything, everything, yeah, everything he has, belongs to you. God with us. <clears throat> this is your baby. He came to bring hope to the hopeless, healing to the hurt, life to the dead. Through his victory, we have what we don't deserve, our victory. 
this Christmas, just like every other one you've ever experienced, I can tell you one thing about it. It will not be perfect. I know somewhere in your mind, because your mind does this, mine does too, you have in your mind some day in the past where Christmas was perfect. And you know why you have that in your mind? <coughs> because you don't remember very well. <laughs> but something in you longs for it. And that Christmas that you long for of perfection hasn't happened yet. It didn't happen 2,000 years ago in a manger. It was only a perfect gift. It couldn't have been a perfect Christmas. Because a perfect Christmas hasn't happened yet. A perfect Christmas happens when that day we're called into his presence. He welcomes us to the family table. And he welcomes us as his brothers and sisters. Children of the same heavenly Father. Brought in not by birth, but by the beautiful gift of adoption. Just as valuable and just as precious. Because it costs him everything to purchase that adoption for us. My prayer for you this Christmas, wherever you are on your first Christmas kind of scale, is that you would look forward and hope in anticipation of that day that is yet to come. That as you come to his table, and once again he reminds you, he gives you a taste of that foretaste, as he declares in his own words, his very body and blood and bread and wine for the forgiveness of your sins, for the strengthening of your faith, he invites you again to come. One day, one day, he'll invite you. Until that day, may he keep you in that grace and in that promise, looking forward to the day where the tears will be no more. The party, the party will finally be perfect. Let me pray for this. Heavenly Father, we thank you for choosing us. We thank you for seeing us in our misery and need and jumping in with both feet into this world with real flesh and blood. You, Emmanuel, God with us. Thank you for seeing what we could not do and doing it for us. Living that perfect life. Dying a death upon a cross, carrying upon yourself all of the burdens, all the brokenness, all of the hurts that, that, we, that we hold on to so tightly. So Lord, this Christmas, help us to turn them over to you. To know that you are the God who comes and brings hope to the hopeless, healing to the hurting, strength to the weak, and life even to the dead. So Lord, until that day, we join you for that perfect Christmas. Fill us with the hope and assurance and send us forth. Send us forth like those shepherds that very first Christmas with a message of joy and of hope. We might not know all the details. We might not have it all figured out, but we know who does. And that's you, Jesus, because you came for us. You promised to come again. So until that day, keep us in that faith, clinging to you. It's in your dear name we pray, Jesus. Amen. We continue our worship this night by gathering our time.